Well, I think the speak this uh, microphone is working. So is everybody hearing me back there? Okay. Yeah. All right. Welcome everybody. Glad to see a nice bunch out tonight. I don't think I see any faces that I haven't seen before. So uh, uh, we'll just carry right on. Uh, I haven't got any correspondence or announcements. Everything seems to be really quiet right now. Everybody's waiting to build up for Christmas probably. So I would like to introduce our speakers. Uh, once again, we're fortunate to have uh, uh, local military historians, Tom Slater and uh, Randy Evans, and they're going to speak to us tonight. And um, Tom is a retired teacher, Randy is a retired lawyer, and, and you probably saw their articles in the special edition of the Sarnia Journal this past weekend. Um, both are dedicated researchers of Sarnia's military history, and tonight Tom and Randy will talk about the Battle of Emmy Ridge. So welcome, Tom and Randy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Randy Evans, and uh, I'm here with my partner, Mr. Tom Slater. Uh, this is our third year to be here, and we're pleased to uh, come. And, of course, we're going to speak on Vimy Ridge this year because, of course, that's been so topical, uh, being the anniversary um, of this particular year. Tom? Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to start by just reading a, a couple of quotes. Uh, in any national story... There are moments and places, sometimes far from home, which in retrospect can be seen as fixed points about which the course of history turns, moments which distinguish that nation forever. Those who seek the foundations of Canada's distinction would do well to begin at Vimy. Within just a few hours on that cold and gloomy Easter morning, the Canadians became masters of the ridge, managing what most thought impossible. The Canadian Corps transformed Vimy Ridge from a symbol of despair into a source of inspiration. After two and a half years of daily stalemate, it now seemed possible that the Allies would prevail and peace might one day be restored. Those words were from Queen Elizabeth. They, she, that she was speaking at the 90th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge when they were rededicating the Vimy Memorial. Canada uh, declared war in August of 1914. By October of 1914, Canadians were already over there. The Battle of Vimy Ridge uh, started with uh, Canadians moving towards Vimy Ridge in the fall of uh, uh, 1916. Up to that point in time, uh, there have been uh, some major battles, particularly I'm sure everybody knows about the Battle of the Somme. It was a disaster. The Allies were looking for a victory and uh, things had not gone well. By the time of uh, Vimy Ridge, Canada had already suffered 42,000 casualties, which is staggering when you think about the population of Canada at the time. Go ahead. Can we turn uh, it up a bit or something? Uh, Jay, can the volume be turned up a little bit? Volume? Okay. If you say something, Tom. Hello? Can you hear it okay? That better? All right, okay. I'd uh, miss the fact that uh, in the last, uh, the last slide you saw the uh, trenches, about 700 kilometers of trenches from Switzerland through uh, France and Belgium. And uh, the reason for the trenches was the, uh, the troops dug down because the, uh, the death was above the ground, namely artillery primarily. Vimy Ridge was, um, by the time the Canadians got there, it was described as an immense graveyard. The French had tried to take Vimy Ridge twice and got slaughtered. Uh, by the time the Canadians got there, the, uh, the ridge was literally 
uh, uh, a graveyard of Frenchmen. It has to be remembered that by the time the Canadians got to the ridge, the uh, Germans had been entrenched there since the start of the war. So as a result, their fortifications were concrete, and most importantly, they were looking down on the Allies. As Randy mentioned, I guess the, the defenses, the, the Germans had captured the ridge in October of 1914, so they'd spent two and a half years fortifying their defenses on the ridge, uh, and, and assaults had cost uh, tens of thousands of French and British soldiers. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a, just a nice image that shows some of the uh, obstacles that they had to uh, overcome to take this ridge. First off, they were attacking uphill higher position, so right off, you're in a tough situation. They had to press, so as you kind of see, start on the left here, you see there's no man's land, so they're going through this shell-pocked no man's land, wide open, then they hit the line, the rows and rows of, of uh, barbed wire, some of it as high as a house, then there'd be three lines of defense defense trenches, all manned with, with enemy soldiers, uh, with weapons, there was concrete uh, dugouts, tunnels, uh, machine and gun uh, firing posts, mines, hidden snipers, grenades, mortars, uh, shell fire and shrapnel shells and poison gas. Aircraft were overhead monitoring what was going on. Plus, for the Canadians, they would have to uh, not be worry about being hit by their own shells, as well as if they did gain any ground, there'd be immediate enemy counterattacks. Next. Um, Vimy Ridge was, was part of a larger uh, off British offensive called the Battle of Arras. Um, and um, kind of the top there, you'll see Vimy Ridge. The Canadians were tasked with taking Vimy Ridge, which was the most impregnable part of the whole German defensive line. Uh, to the south, like uh, north of Arras, south of Arras, were British forces attacking. Not on this map, farther south, French forces were attacking. So this was a huge offensive that was around, based around the city of Arras, hence the Battle of Arras. Uh, the Canadians, like I say, being tasked with the most formidable part. The two points I'll point out, because they'll come up later, up there it says Hill 45. It's actually Hill 145, It's meaning it's 145 meters above sea level. That was the high point on the ridge. Uh, and above that, north of that, there's a little valley and another high point at 135 meters called the Pimple. Those two were kind of the high points that the Canadians would have to be tasked with taking as well. This is uh, Lieutenant uh, General Julian Bing. When Bing uh, was put in charge of the Canadians, he was quoted as saying, why am I sent the Canadians? I don't even know a Canadian. By the time he was done, he certainly did. He be, uh, the troops, they love the guy. Um, they became known as Bing's boys. Bing... Uh, would uh, fight uh, the bureaucracy, he got them better weapons, he got them better provisions, he believed in preparation for battle, unlike the British generals, and of course we all know that, uh, we all know that he became the Governor General. Of uh, local interest, uh, Bing dedicated the uh, Point Edward Cenotaph. The other key player in uh, this uh, event was, was Arthur Curry. Uh, he was a Canadian born in Strathroy. In September of 1915, he had been, was put in charge of the 1st Division of the Canadian Corps. In battles leading up to Vimy Ridge, uh, he was the one that convinced uh, Bing about the importance of things like detailed planning and the coordination of artillery and infantry, key things that would play a role in Vimy Ridge. Uh, one of his quotes was, pay, pay for the price of victory in shells, not lives. He, was, he had abhorred casualties. He did everything he could to avoid casualties. Um, at Vimy Ridge, he would be, he'd be a key planner with Bing, uh, and he would be in charge of the 1st Division at Vimy Ridge. Um, after Vimy Ridge, he would take command of the, the entire Canadian Corps, and uh, he would lead them from then till the end of the war, victory after victory. Um, 
and uh, many historians believe he's the best Canadian commander that this country's ever produced. Okay. It's uh, important to remember that at Vimy Ridge, it's the first time that all four Canadian divisions were together, which um, always uh, caused me uh, the question, we were all in at Vimy Ridge, can you imagine if we didn't win the battle? what that would have done. But in any event, they uh, decided to roll the dice. The uh, proposition was that all four Canadian divisions would go over. The, uh, they would follow a creeping barrage of British and Canadian artillery. The first wave would get to their objective, and then the second wave would leapfrog over them. They'd be fresher troops, and they'd leapfrog, and so on and so on, as they went up, uh, as they went up the ridge, given less, less than eight hours to take the entire ridge. Um, and you can see the core strength over 97,000, tremendous amount of men. That's not including the tens of thousands of horses. It's just the, uh, just the capital that the nation of Canada put into this one particular battle is just purely incredible. Go ahead, please. Uh, just a number of slides here dealing with the preparations leading up, because preparation is key to the success of this battle. Uh, it verges on the unbelievable. It would include vast armies of engineers, labor units, tunneling companies, loggers, carpenters, locomo locomotive engineers, infantrymen toiling day and night. Uh, here they're showing strengthening the, the, the trenches, the funk holes. One Canadian private wrote back to his parents, I could tell you more about feeling sandbags than fighting. We will soon have all of France in sandbags. Next one. Uh, just carrying the trench mats. This, again, the terrain was slopping in mud and water, often while under fire, 24 hours a day. A lot of the work being done at night and in the cold because this is it's not spring yet. They're preparing. Next. Uh, horses and mule teams strained to carry the heavy loads forward, uh, slopping through the mire and the mud, again under constant fire, Hundreds and hundreds of horses would be killed. Uh, they would carry tons of ammunition and supplies forward. Not only were horses killed by direct fire, indirect fire, and shrapnel, hundreds would be uh, mercy killed uh, because they were simply worked to death. Uh, this is showing the trucks moving the supplies forward. Again, narrow, shell-pocked roads covered in mud and water. They'd move supplies, ammunition, and arms. And uh, uh, again, I think Randy mentioned not only to supply close to 100,000 troops, but 50,000 horse and mules. They had to bring all the food and water forward to them as well. Next. Uh, men were built, they had to build roads, repair, level roads, add planking to roads uh, to bring for forward supplies. Uh, water mains, they had to construct water mains, pipelines, reservoirs are dug and pumping stations were installed all to feed the troops to front. Next. Uh, rail lines, building rail lines for, for the light trams. Next. Uh, which would be used to again move supplies, ammunition uh, forward and ultimately casualties back. Next. Uh, besides these things, the support behind the lines there were gunners, stretcher bearers, surgeon, cooks, transport drivers, mule skinners, foresters, engineers, and runners, all hived in the tunnels and, and sunken roads behind the front line. Next. Uh, miles of electric cable had to be buried seven feet below ground, and hundreds of miles of telephone wire were strung, building a, a complex communication network. Go on to the next, please. <clears throat> Uh, part of the preparation as well, they, uh, they did uh, a series of 13 tunnels. The tunnels would act offensively from the point of view that eventually some of them were, would be filled with explosives underneath the uh, str str strongholds of the enemy. Uh, primarily, however, they were defensive in that they stored the men uh, and shielded them from the artillery prior to uh, entering the field of battle. And of course, because of the, they were a tunnel, it got the it, it restricted or lessened the amount of exposure the men had on the field of battle. They kind of got a head start to the fight. If you go on, please. Just uh, some pictures of the tunnel and the, some of the graffiti that the guys uh, put on the tunnels, um, names, insignias, that type of idea. You gotta remember, this is uh, the the, uh, the the in Flanders, it's chalk. The the base is basically chalk, so you you know the guys could inscribe into the chalk. It wasn't rock. Yeah, next, please. As well, they had balloons for reconnaissance. Uh, next, please. 
It gives you an idea of a balloon, but you can see the recognizance they get out. You see right at the bottom of that picture, you can actually see the webbing of the balloon. The basket. And the, yeah, the, the, basket. Ba the basket, yeah. yeah. That's what I call it. Anyways, you can, see the, uh, you can see the formations of the uh, uh, tunnels, or uh, pardon me, the trenches. And as well, they had uh, airplanes for uh, recognizance as well. Of course, the Germans had their airplanes too there. Of note, uh, Billy Bishop was there, and the Red Baron was there as well. Not Snoopy, the real one. <laughs> uh, trench raiding. This was a Canadian innovation that had been started in battles prior, but they still started to really develop their own Vimy time. And this is where during the night, small groups of men would kind of cover themselves in black uh, and kind of crawl across no man's land, uh, inching their way forward through barbed wire into the en enemy trench, ambush them, kind of a quick, uh, they would call them butcher and bolt last a few minutes and then hustle back to their own their own lines and initially these these uh, trench raids were carried by uh, by a f just a handful of men but as time went on it became quite a competitive thing between battalions and the, the trench raids became uh, larger and larger more groups of men in the three months before the assault canadian corps launched 55 trench raids uh, the goals of the trench raids were to inflict terror cause casualties hamper the enemy's ability to lay barbed wire, gather intelligence, and capture prisoners. Weapons included light machine guns, pistols, hand grenades, handmade clubs, and trenching tools, even brass knuckles. Next. Uh, on March 1st, in the early morning hours of March 1st, 1917, was the largest Canadian trench raid. Four battalions of the 4th Def Division would carry out this trench raid, 1,700 men. Uh, the 4th Division was also the youngest, the freshest group of men, and they wanted to kind of prove themselves. Uh, unfortunately, the Germans were fully alert to the attack. The Canadians had released some poison gas up the hill, which unfortunately the wind brought it back down to the Canadians. So now the Canadians advanced into this cloud of gas to a fully alert German army. Um, and, and so they had, the wire hadn't been cut. Uh, a lot of the Canadian own artillery shells were falling short. So ultimately, Canadians in that short time, 687 were killed or wounded, 43% casualty rate, so much so that the Germans offered a two-hour truce so the Canadians could go collect their dead. Um, and so that was on March 1st. So that loss of that many men would have a, an effect a month later. Next one. Uh, all this reconnaissance, whether it's the aircraft or all these things that were going on that preceded, all this recon allowed the development of the, the Canadians built models and a full-scale replica course behind their lines. These models had all the trenches and tunnels and barbed wire and gun emplacements marked so that the soldiers could not only see where their objectives were, they could even train on this replica course and walk through it so they knew exactly where they had to go uh, and what they had to overcome. Uh, also, 40,000 maps were issued to the troops. That empowered the troops to know exactly where their objectives were and the timelines they had to get there. Um, and each platoon was, uh, became a self-contained unit where each man in that unit knew their job. Most importantly, if one man went down, he was quickly replaced. Most importantly, it was the lead officer. If the lead officer went down, things didn't come to a halt. The next guy in line just took a spot, and we kept moving forward. Next, please. Uh, that last point that Tom was talking about is really important because they did some innovative uh, innovations um, as well as the uh, devolving command. This was the first battle that they gave the guys maps. Believe it or not, this was the first battle they gave the guys maps. The, the British Blue Bloods thought that maps were military secrets, and as a result, they wouldn't entrust them to the guys on the ground which is really kind of counterproductive when you think about it, because they're the guys whose butts are on the line, right? So in any event, <clears throat> artillery, key to success. More destruction and more death was visited uh, by artillery than anything else in the, in the First World War. Artillery had advanced scientifically far past uh, basic uh, military strategy going into the war. It was a scientific, it's, it's like our atomic bombs nowadays. It, it just, it just outstrips some of the, some of the old uh, thoughts about the artillery. Leading up, uh, you can go to the next one. The week leading up to the week of uh, the actual over the top, over a million shells 
had been fired at the Germans. And of course, the uh, <clears throat> when we got to the point of the guys going over top, of course, they were following the barrage of shells as well. So the, the she artillery served two purposes. Number one, to destroy what to what extent they could the Germans' uh, strongholds, and number two, to provide cover as we went through. You've got to remember about shells. When they exploded, the shells, uh, firstly, you'd have the concussion from the explosion. Secondly, you'd have the red-hot shrapnel as the casing broke off. And, of course, that you know that would fly through. As well, at, at, at times, they were actually packing the shells with uh, ball bearings. So you can imagine a ball bearing going through. And, you know, a, a ball bearing would kind of put a hole in you about that big in the front. By the time it went out the back, there'd be hardly anything left of you. That's why there's so many bodies you couldn't find. Yeah, go ahead, please. And this is, a, you see uh, Andrew McNaughton there. And, of course, Andrew McNaughton led the Corps in the Second World War. Andrew McNaughton was a scientist from um, McGill University, and he was credited as perfecting uh, artillery uh, shooting. They could actually, they actually got to the point where they could pinpoint pillboxes and that type of idea and fire on them directly at, from a distance. Next. Well, one, of the, one of the advances McNaughton made was they had to make all these adjustments to things like air temperature, wind direction, uh, air pressure. Uh, he he uh, perfected that science. Uh, some of the high explosive shells carried this new 106 fuse, trigger fuse. It meant nothing to me until I learned about it. The, the, the fuse was, was now would explode on contact with barbed wire, something that the shrapnel cells couldn't do or weren't very good at. These shells would hit barbed wire and immediately blow up the barbed wire so it would be ripped apart. There'd be big holes and shreds ripped in the barbed wire. Now, unfortunately, at night, quite often the Germans would just replace new barbed wire, but it, it helped. Next one. Uh, targets. I just listed some of the targets that the shells were going for. So besides providing cover, barbed wire, trench lines, dugouts, machine gun nets, nests, gun emplacements, the big guns, and lines of communication. Next one. Uh, this is an actual map that the gunners, the Canadian British gunners, would use, uh, a, a barrage map. Um, and these, the lines that are essentially going vertical, those were lift lines. So uh, this would be their target. So two would aim for a certain line, and then a certain time would go by, they'd lift, and now the shells would drop at the next line. A certain time would go by, they'd lift, go to the next line. Uh, the troops, the infantry would advance behind that curtain, uh, they would, they called it the Vimy Glide, this precisely timed advance uh, where the soldiers would, they would, it was called hugging the wall. If you fell too far back, you were exposed. If you got too close, you were hit by your own shells. So it was very, very precise, this Vimy Glide, moving approximately 100 yards every three minutes. Uh, it was Bing himself that told his soldiers, chaps, you, will show, you shall go over exactly like a railroad train, on time, or you shall be annihilated. Here go to the next one, please. All right, really good shot of an artillery going off. And the first, uh, the week before the assault, only half of the batteries uh, opened up to soften up the position. However, uh, in the week immediately before the uh, uh, going over the top, 2,500 tons of ammunition was fired every day by the uh, artillery. Um, the, uh, of course, it just did that. Uh, next one, please. Did uh, That's a very famous pitch painting. Um, of course, uh, the design was to uh, knock out the trenches, knock out the barbed wire, soften up the uh, German front. A Canadian observer uh, said, shells poured over our heads like water from a hose. And you can figure at 2,500 tons of ammunition every day why the Germans called it the week of suffering. Uh, next one. Uh, these are Vickers machine guns. They, they could fire 500 bullets a minute. From the first week of March onwards, a number of these Vickers machine guns were, were targeting the enemy, uh, and they would call it a bullet barrage. So these guns were just tilted skyward and fired into the air, and this bu bullets would rain down on the enemy. Uh, they're, they're, each brigade, the guns were, were grouped together, so 64 guns would fire by day, another 64 by night. And all, just add this to their artillery, was meant to disrupt 
the, the, the enemy, uh, prevent them from uh, bringing supplies to the front, prevent them from repairing trenches, uh, hampering the deliver supplies, filling the gaps left by artillery fire. Next one. Uh, so all that's preparation. Now the actual attack. Uh, on the eve, so this is the night of April 8th, uh, now you've got thousands of Canadian infantrymen moving to the front line, moving to, into the trenches, into the, the uh, tr shell holes, uh, into the jumping, the subways, uh, crowding together in the cold. Uh, there's artillery going overhead, the ground is shaking at their feet, they're huddling in the dark. Uh, getting ready for the next morning. They were going to go early the next morning. Uh, for a lot of these soldiers, no doubt their thoughts turned to home because this was Easter weekend. So a lot of their families would be back home here in Canada, would be gathering for the traditional Easter dinner. So no doubt a lot of these soldiers would write potentially last letters home or write words in their, in their diaries. In the previous, uh, we can go back one. You'll see the uh, young man. See the young man right in the middle. He's actually writing a letter home, and you can consider him to be symbolic of uh, Private Jack McClung, 19-year-old member of the Princess Pats from Alberta. And this is what he wrote the night before, and he wrote his folks: Easter Sunday night, and we go over the top tomorrow morning at 5:30. I guess the fellow has more sensations and feelings in this short night than his whole life. I fixed up all my bombs, 15 and all, clean rifle, bayonet, and ammunition, and then sat down. Some fellows are singing songs, sacred and otherwise. One fellow has tried to start just before the battle mother, but it was a failure. Another kind of song gets an ovation, but each of us are trying to hide the real state of his mind. I know how much I am thinking about mother, dad, and all the kids. The sooner I can get back, the better, and the more I do to help end it, the better. Uh, April 9th, the morning of April 9th. Again, this is, uh, you have to imagine this scene is in darkness. These guys are waking up in, in absolute darkness. Terrible weather day. There was sleet, rain, and snow falling uh, in the early morning hours. Those that did, did sleep overnight were, were awakened, and they were offered their, their kind of a meal, possibly warm porridge, usually cold meat and some bread. Uh, officers would break out the battle rum and the soldiers would get their, their shot of this thick syrupy concoction that passed for rum that would kind of burn on its way down but it would help steady the nerves and provide this momentary warmth before they went over the top and then they would huddle together shivering in the cold again the ground is shaking above them ready for the big show to open up next one you can see the uh, gents, they're going over the top. At 5.28 a.m., they fixed bayonets in preparation. Uh, the Vickers machine guns went off. Two minutes later, at 5.30 a.m., the uh, artillery opened up. Uh, mines went blowing off in the, in, from some of the tunnels. Uh, burning oil was fired over at the, at the Germans. And over the top they go. I'm not sure whether you can see a, uh, a flash there, but I'm just wondering if... Uh, God, if I was there, I'd know that flask would be full, full of that rum. Next one. Uh, 21 1st Canadian Battalions went over the top 15,000 Canadian soldiers at, at 5.30 in the morning. They'd advance through the snow, the sleet, straight into the face of enemy fire. Underground tunnels were blown so that they would come out from the tunnels below, surging forward into no man's land. It was a straightforward frontal assault. Uh, following their creeping barrage, 100 yards every three minutes, trying to keep pace with this curtain of fire and steel. Yeah, uh, you'll see a quote here from Lieutenant G. Clark. Lieutenant G. Clark, some of you will probably remember, is Gregory Clark from the Toronto Star Weekly. He used to write a column in the, uh, in the weekend uh, weekly. And he wrote uh, this in regard to the creeping barrage. In one sense, it was a beautiful sight. It was still quite dark. Sleet was falling. There before us, right frightfully close, was the edge of hell. It blazed, flashed, and flickered, the bursting shells. And white and colored flares were fired frantically by a distracted enemy. And the flashing, flickering light showed an infernal wall of twisting, boiling smoke and flame against which stood out the distorted silhouettes of men in advancing into it. Next, please. Uh, with tens of thousands of shells, and hundreds of thousands of bullets whirling over their heads, 
The infantrymen pushed forward through the mud in some places thigh deep. They stumbled and pushed forward through the smoke, through the explosions, through the craters, the sinkholes, the shell holes, over the barbed wire, into the, dr the jaws of the enemy counter barrage. Chemical shells, machine guns, mortars, grenades, and small arms and sniper fire. Officers tried to scream commands, but nothing could be heard over the din of the shells overhead that sounded like trains passing in continuous runs. Thank you. Uh, the following... Yeah. Thank you. Wounded men were sprawled everywhere in the slime and the shell holes and the mine craters, some screaming to the skies, some lying silently, some begging for help, some struggling to keep from drowning in the water-filled craters, the field swarming with stretcher bearers trying to keep up with the casualties. Next, please. Uh, directly behind the first wave, Sitting in the tunnels and the trenches with his, with his supporting wave ready to go, waiting for their t time, 12,000 more infantrymen waited their turn for advance. At a set time, they were given the signal to move forward where they would leapfrog the initial assault line. Uh, they would clear strong points, bypass by lead units, and do any mopping up. Mopping up involved bombing, sheltering dugouts, disarming pres prisoners and sending them to the rear, and fighting the, the, the bitter enders. Number of tanks were at Vimy, eight in fact, uh, but they were worthless. They either got bogged down in the mud or they hit by shells, so they made no impact at Vimy. Yeah, we can stay, stay here. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, moving forward in the full light of that clouded April morning, we learned full well the nature of the great modern battlefield. This was war. The wounded, friend and foe alike, lay everywhere in the cold, wet mud, silent and helpless in their agony, or crying out for help to the stretcher bearers who fanned out behind the attacking waves. Next, please. So we're still on April 9th. This kind of gives you an idea of what happened on that April 9th. You kind of start at the bottom with the 1st Canadian Division. 1st Canadian Division had to travel the longest distance, 4 kilometers, but it was the most gentle slope. And they would reach just outside of Farbus Wood, uh, they would reach that point by 1.30 in the afternoon. The second division, so the blue one, uh, they would have to advance a shorter distance, 3.2 kilometers, but it was a little bit more steep. Uh, they would pass through a couple of little hamlets and reach the village of Farbus by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The third division, the pale blue, uh, they would advance an even shorter distance, 1.2 kilometers, but again, now steeper. They were very successful. In fact, they'd reached their objective of La Foley Wood by 8 o'clock in the morning. It only took them two and a half hours. But here's where the problem was. Because they got there so fast, an une unexpected hazard was to their left flank, the 4th Division hadn't adva advanced to their objectives yet, specifically Hill 145. So the 3rd Division got to their point, but now the rain things were raining down on them from Hill 145 to their left flank. Stay here. Thank you. With respect to the 4th Division, uh, the, uh, they badly underestimated the strength of the German stronghold at that particular point. And the 4th Division was in chaos at this point in time. And it was uh, struggling and needed reinforcements in the worst way. And at that point in time, they called up uh, the Nor Nova Scotia Highlanders. Now, this is pretty significant because the Nova Scotia Highlanders, they were a labor group. They weren't a fighting battalion. And they traded in their shovels and their picks and everything else for guns and bayonets and uh, rifles. And they led a charge into the hill and took it at a tremendous cost. But uh, an extraordinary story. Extraordinary story. So at the end of April 9th, the costs. Uh, terribly costly. Thousands of casualties. Four Vic Victoria Crosses for Uncommon Valor were awarded that day. Three of them posthumously. April 9th was the single bloodiest day in the entire war for the Canadian Corps. In fact, it's the bloodiest day in all of Canadian military history. Uh, if you look at other disasters, it was the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Beaumont Hamel, the Dieppe Raid in 42, and D-Day in 44. This one day still beat them for casualty numbers. Then all three of those combined. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Uh, the next, the following three days, April 10th, 
Uh, following this terrible, again, April 9th, the night of, it's cold, it's snowing, the shelling continues. In the mid-afternoon of April 10th, two battalions of the 10th Brigade, they're at the top there, but they actually, two battalions swung down to the bottom end there, to Hill 145, and they vaulted over Hill 145 and took the eastern side of the slope. So they, they were knocked the Germans completely off of Hill 145, so the Canadians now have 145 in their, in their control. Uh, April 11th was was a lick their wounds day, which meant rest, reorganization, and digging in. But understand there was still constant artillery fire and enemy fire back and forth. Uh, April 12th, the objective was now the pimple. This was that after the ridge is a valley, and then there's this pimple, this other high point. And it was again, it had been captured in, in 1914, so it was bristling with concrete pillboxes, hidden snipers, machine guns, tunnels, dugouts, trenches, uh, mines, barbed wire, booby traps. So just like on April 9th, in the early mornings of April 12th, in a raging snowstorm, three battalions would advance behind the creeping barrage towards the pimple. And we have a quote from a member of the 50th Battalion uh, who, who attacked. From the very first minute of the attack, we came under murderous and hellish fire from machine guns. We lost about 30% of the fighting forces before we got into the green line of trenches and then went into hand-in-hand -in -hand fighting. As we looked back the, up that ridge in the early dawn, we witnessed a scene never to be forgotten. The entire face of the hill was covered with German green and Canadian khaki. Men lay out there in that blood-soaked field, some dead, some dying. And Canadians captured the pimple in less than two hours. The next one, please. <coughs> Now, this is the Canadians at the top of Vimy Ridge looking down the uh, plains of Douai. And when you look at the, when you look at the background, how, how steep it is, it gives you an idea how steep the ridge was. Because to get to the top of the ridge, that's how far down it goes. So that gives you a really good idea how, how high uh, the guys had to fight up and, and, of course, how much of an advantage the Germans had looking down at them as they were going up the ridge. Next, please. Uh, the capture of Vimy Ridge, by the way, made news not only across Europe and in Canada, but even the U.S. And the U.S. was extolling the, the, the tremendous success the Canadians had at Will Hill, uh, at Vimy Ridge. Uh, after the battle, now, in, uh, during the battle as well, soldiers worked to recover the wounded from the trenches, from no man's land, from the craters, from the dugouts, from the barbed wire. Uh, difference between life and death quite often depended on how quickly they could get these guys back uh, to the dressing stations problem was there was constant shelling and sniper fire so quite often a lot of these wounded men would have to lay out on the ground for long periods of time hoping someone would be able to come and rescue them some of them would just wriggle and drag themselves themselves to back to the front line biting back the pain uh, stretcher bears uh, they would often carry a canteen of rum to ease the pain and they would ferry these soldiers back to the field dressing stations each company had four stretcher bearers, and normally it would take two stretcher bearers to take a single man back, but because of the terrain and the mud and everything, this normally took four men to carry a, man, a wounded soldier back, and quite often it would take several hours to get them back because, again, they were being exposed to fire, uh, and uh, uh, they would be dropping the guys through the muddy terrain, etc. Uh, using tram lines, and you'll probably notice some German soldiers, they were uh, enlisted to help bring back a lot of the Canadian wounded as well. Uh, the wounded were dropped in triage areas where medical officers or orderlies would try to attempt to do whatever first aid they could, bind wounds, immobilize broken bones, uh, perform surgery if they could. Uh, those who were not in danger were sent back farther back to the rear hospitals. Those that could be saved with quick operations right there were performed right there. Uh, and those two badly wounded were quite often just left to die, unfortunately, because decisions had to be made. And if one man's injuries, wounds were so bad that he was going to require a lot of time, a lot of manpower, we just walk away. Unfortunately, we have to let him die because that could cost other people's lives. Um, of course, there's some... Uh, <clears throat> Some men in the uh, infantry who were uh, detailed to uh, recover the corpses. Uh, when they recovered the corpses, uh, there each each man had two identity identity discs on it. This is assuming there's a corpse. Okay, remember how many 
uh, uh, unknown soldiers that are over there. It's a tremendous percentage. But assuming there's a corpse, the corpse would have identity discs, two. One would be left with the corpse, one would be collected, and then passed up the chain for eventual advisement back here in Canada. Um, uh, communal, communal graves, sometimes shallow graves. Um, you got to remember the artillery is still going overhead right now, so the, you know they could only do so much. And when when they would come back, of course they would make notes of where they buried the guys. But by the time they got back, sometimes those those graves were, you know, no longer in existence as well. Uh, too often we pull out a picture. This quote: There he stands, and and she sits beside him. How smart he looks in his new uniform, and how proud and happy she looks. Here's a family group. There he is. The others must be his father and mother and kids' sisters. Damn this dirty, lousy, stinking, bloody war. Uh, next couple. Uh, these are just to show some of the destruction. Uh, uh, one of the larger craters uh, called, caused by a mine explosion. Uh, what's left of the village of Farbus? Uh, one of the German uh, gun emplacements. Uh, the next two show some of the uh, big guns that were captured. This one's an 8-inch German naval gun. Uh, one of the big howitzers, 8-inch howitzers. Uh, I thought it was neat. This one, the, the Canadian soldiers painted City of Winnipeg on the side of it. If you can make out, you might be able to make out City, but City of Winnipeg is written on there. And a lot of these guns would just simply be turned around now and used against the Germans. Uh, a few of the captured German machine guns. Excellent. Uh, for those four days in April, uh, 97,000 Canadians fought at Vimy Ridge. Approximately 7,400 were wounded, and close to 3,600 would lose their lives in that four days. Add to that number, over 9,000, 9,500 casualties suffered in the weeks and months leading up to Vimy Ridge due to sniper fire, artillery fire, and trench raids. A lot of people forget that number. They kind of focus on the 7,000 and 3,600, but 9,500 were lost leading up to. In addition to that, next one, please. You recall, you recall that uh, we talked about the Battle of Arras as being a, a larger, Vimy was only part of that. In addition to the Canadian casualties of Vimy, uh, in the British sector, the British suffered over 150,000 casualties. Uh, during those days. You'll see the German casualties, 130 to 160,000, which of course is important because they, they had, at this point in time, had started into the war of attrition. You just kill more guys off and they're killing us off and the last guy standing wins. Um, <clears throat> one thing to remember about Vimy Ridge, I think we're all, Vimy Ridge was a very important Canadian uh, victory. Of course, it's part of our folklore now in, in, in our country. But must remember that Vimy Ridge did not bring an end to the war. The war was still going to be going on for another year and a half. And um, there were um, greater and uh, more important battles to come. Uh, but the British considered it a success because of the Canadian success at Vimy Ridge. Next one. This is a, from the Sarnia newspaper. Uh, Sarnia, like the rest of Canada, would learn about the Battle of Vimy Ridge on April 13th. Uh, the headlines here, self-explanatory, all Canadian troops in the big fight now. The subheading was the Canadians have smashed the German lines again. Trenches were taken one mile south of Vimy in an impetuous dash. Another headline read, how the Canadians stormed Vimy Ridge with a subheading, cheering, singing, and confident. They swept up the slopes of the German stronghold through snowstorm. Uh, also in that front page, there was another article, preparing family for what was to come. I'll just read a portion of that report. So this is April 13th. Now that the list of casualties from last week's battle are beginning to appear in the Canadian newspapers, uh, it may bring solace to the sad hearts, sad hearts at home to know how carefully the wounded were handled and how reverently the dead were buried. Talks about hospital arrangements, a lot of hospital arrangements, extra ambulances were provided, many supplementary, day sta supplementary dressing stations were opened, there was little congestion anywhere, thousands of wounded casually walked back to the stations, not requiring any aid, and soaring relatives back in Canada uh, could take solace in knowing that the men take comfort in the fact that their dead soldiers have been cared for as reverently as if they had been laid to the rest in the family plot at home. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, through research, we were able to uncover there was four Sarnians died at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Uh, these are the four. This is off the Sarnia Cenotaph. Uh, David Kerr, he was born in Scotland. His Kerr family would emigrate to Sarnia. David was in his early 20s. He would marry a Sarnia girl. Together they would have four children. David was a member of the concert band, a popular singer. He was employed, employed by an insurance company here in town. And at 33 years old, with four kids at home, he enlisted became a sergeant with the RCRs, and he was killed on the first day of the Battle of Vimy, Vimy Ridge, simply recorded as killed in action April 9th, attack at Vimy Ridge. He left behind his wife and four children, aged 6 through 11. Frederick Johnson, he was born in London, eldest, family, eldest in a family of three children. Johnson family would move to Sarnia. Frederick would work as a laborer here in town. He was 27 and single when he enlisted. He would survive the Battle of the Somme. He was also killed on the first day of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. He has no known grave. Thank you. With respect to uh, Mr. Officer Montgomery, um, he was born in Carleton uh, near Ottawa. His older sister would marry and move to Sarnia, and uh, he resided in Sarnia for a period of time with his sister. He was killed uh, uh, on the second day of the battle, and he died of wounds, suffered in action. Uh, Roy Lumley was uh, 21. He was single. He worked at Cleveland uh, Sawmill Company, enlisted here in Sarnia. He was killed on the second day as well. They had, um, tragically, uh, he got caught up in the uh, barbed wire, and uh, they had to cut him down from the barbed wire. Uh, very shortly after the Battle of Vimy Ridge, memorials and monuments of different kinds started to be erected on the hill. Uh, this one uh, happens to be in one of the mine craters. <laughs> The memorials took many forms and many shapes, two of them here. Uh, here's one of the larger memorials where Curry himself is speaking at, uh, dedicated to the uh, artillery. Next one. Oh yeah, the quote, yeah. Excuse me one second, folks. I've lost my spot. Yeah. yeah. At that memorial service, the following was recorded. Sharp on the tick of 12, all the big guns in our area fired three volleys at the German lines as a salute, while the men all present presented arms. Then the ceremony began, a hymn, a prayer, a lesson, the Lord's Prayer, a dirge by pipes, the funeral march by the band, and then God save the King. I have never seen men stand straighter or with their heads more proudly lifted, for each felt that a little bit of their own heart was buried there, too. Uh, shortly after the armistice in November 1918, uh, Belgium and France agreed to give Canada eight battle sites that they could use for commemoration of their sacrifices in, in liberating their countries. And originally it was decided that all eight battlefield sites would be treated equally. They would build one model and that, or that one monument and that one monument would be at, at all eight battle sites. So this battlefields commission held a contest, a national contest, uh, asking for design competitions. They had over 160 design drawings submitted and it was shortlisted, shortlisted to 17 finalists. Uh, you might recognize there's a couple memorials that are pretty popular. You, the brooding soldier and of course the Vimy one is in there. Um, one of the designs stood out as being, wow, this is really something. So the jury decided, you know what, we have to make this one monument, the national, Canada's national monument in, in Europe. Um, so we're now going to treat all the eight different sites differently. Each site will have its own memorial, but the one was going to be special. Uh, and it was uh, Walter Allwards, Toronto-born Walter Allwards. Uh, he was inspired by a dream of ghosts rising from the from the hillside, uh, walking like an army of dead soldiers, uh, and that's what inspired him. So uh, originally the plan was to put this national memorial on Hill 62, uh, which was where the Battle of Mount Montsorel uh, was fought. Uh, there's his model in December 1922 with the, uh, with the help of the Prime Minister King at the time. Uh, he said, you know what, Let, let's forget about this Hill 62. Hill 145 is where this memorial should go. Uh, so it took 
that, that's when, so December 22, the decision is made. It took two and a half years to clear the fields of bombs, artillery shells, grenades, and human remains. Allward himself was a fanatic uh, with detail, obsessed with detail. It took him three years to select just the type of stone. He went to monuments and memorials all across Europe uh, just to select a stone. Uh, it took him three years and a stone he found in, in Croatia. Thank you. In uh, 1926, uh, uh, it was decided that uh, the, to inscribe the names of all Canadian missing uh, uh, dead on the uh, front walls and up the staircase. It took four years to sandblast those names into the monument. Um, <clears throat> parts of the line trenches and subways were preserved, and uh, it took 14 years to create the monument from the time of design to completion. Next one, please. Next one, please. In uh, uh, July 1936, uh, King Edward VIII, uh, with a broadcast from C CBC, uh, dedicated and unveiled the Vimy Memorial. <coughs> yep, next one, please. Uh, more than 6,200 Canadian veterans and their families um, paid their way across the Atlantic for the unveiling. And you got to remember, this is during the height of the Depression. So that, that's how much uh, meaning Vimy uh, had to those folks, and quite frankly, probably still does today. Over 100,000 people were there at the unveiling. Uh, next one. Uh, the same year the memorial is being uh, dedicated, in 1936, uh, there were other events taking place in the world that were setting precedence for what was about to happen. Uh, Italian dictator Mussolini was expanding his territory. He would captured the capital of Ethiopia, what's now called Ethiopia, in May of 36. Nazi Germany and fascist Italy formed a Rome-Berlin axis. In Spain, a vicious civil war began in July of 36, where Republicans supported by the Soviet Union fighting against nationalists supported by Germany and Italy. That, that, that war would go on for two and a half years and cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Japanese backed forces would attack in China and in Germany, a revitalized Germany, under, now under, of course, Nazi control and its dictator Adolf Hitler, Gestapo and the SS secret police, well-established concentration camps already open. Germany was well under in doing the remilitarization, even though it was against the Treaty of Versailles. Nuremberg laws were well established, stripping the rights away from the Jews. In March of 36, German forces invaded the Rhineland on the French border. Uh, Germany and Japan signed a, signed a pact against the Soviet Union, and Hitler mandated that all German males between the ages of 10 and 18 must become members of the Hitler Youth. And the whole time, the newly formed League of Nations did nothing. Next one, please. Of course, three years after uh, the unveiling of the Vimy Memorial, uh, Canada again was at war. September 10th, they declared war on uh, on Germany. Notice the um, notice the uh, recruitment poster. Vimy's no longer just a, a war memorial to the the dead in the First World War. Now it's a recruiting poster for the next war. Next one, please. Yeah, we can go next one. Um, actually, you can go back to the one before this. Uh, so, 19, uh, 1940s, when, when Germany starts launching their attacks into these different countries, Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and they eventually get into France, by May, and by May of uh, 1940, they invade France, and uh, by end of June, uh, they've captured the city of Paris. Next one. Uh, Right around the time of the recent the, the uh, Dunkirk evacuation movie that came out, that was kind of the end of, of uh, May into early June. When that was going on, this is what this is out of the Sarnia paper, but this was spread right across the country. Uh, the headline reading uh, what had been done as the German forces were moving through France, and of course many Canadians were pretty upset with that headline. Next one. Um, this is. A day or two later, still in the Canadian newspapers, this one's specifically the Sarnia newspaper. Uh, and at first what grabbed me was you see the Vimy Memorial and you see planes up to the left. And the headline, of course, reading what it does, gives the impression that someone took a picture of this thing actually happening, but realized that picture's taken during the, un during the unveiling ceremony, but it's a little deception. Uh, but uh, I'll read a portion of the story here. Uh, the, 
Canada's memorial to the first war has been smashed to pieces in deliberate bombing attacks by the Germans, according to British Tommies that just returned from Flanders. One soldier uh, told this story a few hours after landing in England. In his words, I stood near the memorial and saw a German dive bomber sweep down and release a load of bombs over the memorial. It was completely shattered. The attack was obviously deliberate. An eyewitness to the destruction of the memorial said the planes returned later and bombed British, French, and Canadian military cemeteries in the vicinity of Vimy Ridge, blasting the tiny crosses into fragments and wrecking the graves. Clearly, Canadians were upset. Excellent. Uh, within a few days of those reports across the country, this picture appeared all across the newspapers that, in fact, Vimy wasn't destroyed. Uh, in fact, Hitler, before he got to Paris, went to the Vimy Memorial. That was his first stop before getting to Paris, where this photograph of him and his, all his generals visiting the, the site. Uh, it was during the war, and during the war, Nazis destroyed a lot of Allied war memorials, but this one was kept intact, and it was on Hitler's order. Hitler had great respect for the memorial, and, and he also was concerned about the thousands of German graves that were in the vicinity, so he didn't want this area to be destroyed. And as a side note, in 1917, Hitler, as a soldier, was at Vimy. Uh, a month or two before the actual Battle of Vimy Ridge, his unit was pulled off the ridge. Otherwise, he would, would have been there fighting in the Battle of Vimy Ridge. He's, he was pulled farther north, his unit. Over the course of the war, of course, uh, it was in German hands, and, uh, of course, Canadians or allies could not visit. But it's noteworthy that the French and Belgians continued to lay wreaths on their Remembrance Days at the memorial. <clears throat> Eventually, they did, uh, after the Battle of Normandy, they did take uh, back Vimy Ridge. Next one, please. Over the years, uh, the significance of Vimy Ridge, as well as the physical being of the memorial, began to deteriorate. You see pictures of it being damaged, it became discolored. And uh, fortunately, in 2002, the Canadian government decided to restore the memorial to the shape it's in now. And work began in 2003. Next one, please. Yeah. It was covered in a shroud for two years. Much, much of the memorial was taken apart, piece by piece. The um, project took approximately three years. Placed new stone in uh, the place of older stone that couldn't be replaced. It was an extraordinary restoration project. Uh, in April 2007, so this goes back to the very first slide, when the Queen spoke, uh, the 90th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, uh, the, the uh, Queen rededicated uh, the Vimy Memorial. Um, and I remember vividly watching this on TV, but because uh, one of the things that struck me was the number of high school kids that were there. I guess I was a high school teacher at the time, and there's a tremendous amount of high school kids, and a lot of people were very excited about, about that, that young people were taking an interest in, the, in this. Uh, the day before this dedication, on April 8th, because uh, this was obviously a very somber event, the rededication of this ceremony, uh, but it kind of, there was a different tone to this uh, event in that the day before, April 8th, uh, Canadian military soldiers in Afghanistan, six soldiers were killed the day before. One of them, of course, would be uh, Corporal Brent Poland. Uh, so the day before, he was killed. So this sent reverberations right across the country. Now suddenly, you know, what's changed? We're still losing soldiers. And suddenly, it, it, it further made, I guess, relevant, further added to the intensity, the somberness, of this event it brought it back home. Um, it was broadcast live on radio and TV, and of course there were no Vimy veterans uh, because that last Canadian Vimy uh, soldier had died in 2004. The next one, please. Just got some uh, close-ups here of the restored uh, memorial. Um, remember we said that it took four years to sandblast the names of the missing uh, dead? Uh, the reason for that, there's 11,285 unknown graves in uh, in uh, the in uh, Flanders um, 28 Sarnia names are on the Vimy Memorial as having no known grave next one please okay next one uh, here's some of the um, uh, pillars and one of the interesting things to note about the uh, with uh, Allward his uh, statues and pillars uh, 
Oh, okay. All right. All right. There's a check mark here with an R, so that's why I was reading it. Um, you know this? No, you're good. All right. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. On or about the memorial, there are 20 allegorical figures, included the spirit of sacrifice, chorus, the defenders, and the male and female uh, mourners in Canada, barefoot. You can go to the next. You can go to the next one. <laughs> no problem. There's your grie there's your grieving woman and man, of course, uh, uh, representing the the folks back home. You can go to the next one, please. That's Canada Barefoot. Remember the uh, picture we had of the guy sitting at the top of the uh, the ridge, looking over the the plains of Dewey. Same thing. That's that's where uh, it is. It's very interesting that Mother Canada they chose to put her looking over the plain as opposed to the battlefield. Uh, Mother Canada looks over a, there's a tomb with a, a helmet and a sword on top of the tomb and there's a plaque that reads, to the valor of their countrymen in the great war and in memory of their 60,000 dead, this moment, monument is raised by the people of Canada. And unlike <coughs> other war memorials, the Vimy Memorial has no soldiers, no rifles, no scenes of battle, no symbols of fighting. Uh, Canadian historian Tim Cook described it as, a monument to peace, not victory. An homage to loss and death and a call to remembrance. Thank you. Next one, please. This is kind of an interesting story. Leslie uh, Miller was a lieutenant at Vimy Ridge. And after the battle, he's looking around for some souvenirs, and he found a half-buried dying English oak tree, and he scooped up a handful of acorns and sent them back to his uh, farm, his father's farm in Scarborough. They planted them. And they took and became known as the Vimy Oaks. In 2005, specialists began grafting these particular oaks, and uh, sa and uh, saplings began to grow, and they're going to be repatriated this year back to Vimy. And um, <clears throat> they'll be planted along the road leading to the Vimy Memorial as well as a living memorial to the fallen. Uh, uh, it's noteworthy as well here in Sarnia, Vimy. Here in Sarnia, Vimy uh, Memorial Bench was dedicated in April of 2017 when we had some uh, uh, Vimy uh, me memorials. Uh, as well, four English oak trees were also planted at the Sarnia Cenotaph, each one to represent one of the, the Sarnians fall, fallen in the battle. So there's a storyboard there that tells the story of Vimy Ridge, and to the left, that's one of the Vimy Oaks representing the four Sarnians. There's four of them there together. Next slide. Uh, Vimy Ridge would be a turning point in the war for the Canadian Corps. It was the first major Allied victory of the war on the Western Front, in which the Canadians captured more ground, more prisoners, and more guns than any previous op operation, all of which had been done against the heaviest of odds. From Vimy onward, the Canadians never lost another set piece or major engagement, delivering victory after victory, often against the most formidable defensive positions. And what began at Vimy Ridge, the Canadian Corps would get this reputation for the rest of the war. They earned the reputation as the shock troops, the ones leading the edge of the sword into the heavy enemy. Next one, please. That, of course, is one of the bittersweet legacies of Vimy Ridge. We became known as shock troops. We became uh, known as uh, terrific fighters. So as a result, we found ourselves in the front all the time, particularly at the uh, last 100 days of fighting. The victory of Vimy Ridge was a pinnacle of Canadian military achievement, igniting national pride. Jack Granistein, who's a historian, said, For the soldiers, no matter from where they came, no matter their origin, no matter how short a time they had lived in Canada, after Vimy, they were all Canadians and bloody proud of the soldier, soldier, soldier flashes and cap badges that proclaimed their allegiance. And Brigadier General Ross, this is a famous quote, it was from Canada from the Arctic to the Pacific on parade. I thought then in the, those few minutes I witnessed the birth of a nation. And of course, that has really taken, taken hold in our, our folklore in Canada. Uh, and, and that's it. Oh, of course you can, yeah. Gee. Okay, you were, you were saying how they 
shot the guns up into the Victor's air. machine guns, yes. So did the, did the bullets... Yeah, just their velocity, rain like by the time they go up and then fall down, are they still dead? I, I guess they're still making an impact because it was meant to deter them from bringing supplies up or repairing barbed wire. Just the constant raining down of these shells. So they would still have an impact. It would be more of a deterrent factor than probably a killing factor. Yeah. And another question. You know the caves, like I, I watch War Junk and all those yes. shows all the time. The caves where the Canadians carved their names into it. Is there an index somewhere that um, that lists oh, all the men that did that? Oh, I uh, I, you know, I'm like you. I watch the war jump things and oh, things like that. I, I, I don't, I've never heard of one. I'd be surprised yeah. if there is. Jim, 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 Jim. Have people go in and record that with photographic, so all the names have been taken there and. They work with the image to get it to stand out so you can see it. But they've done that in all the trenches that you could get into. Is it online? And of course, all all the cavern, they're all the tunnels aren't there, right? The, the, the only few of them have been reopened. Yeah, well, a lot of them were just the names, collapsed. I can't see at this stage, but it's been done about ten years ago at least. I'm just wondering, Veterans Affairs. You might try the Veterans Affairs website. They have a My lot of stuff. My grandfather was there. Oh wow! And I have this little flower. Oh. You still got some Todd or Robin? No. I don't I imagine you would. I don't imagine you would have polished that up pretty quick. I know I would have. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. The Polish army that went to World War II, did they get any of Demi War? They, like, they weren't at Demi Ridge or anything? Like. Not that I know. Not that. They might have been part of it because the, yeah. the whole British the Battle of Erez, the, the, the Canadians, when we focus just on the Canadians at the <coughs> north end of that thing, but again, all south there's a British corps. So there's the, the Kiwis, the Aussies, the Polish. They'd be all part of the British corps that were south of Vimy Ridge attacking yeah, the, the German lines. Army, and there was hundreds of them, yeah. thousands of them from up north. I had uncles go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But there's nothing wrote about them. Yeah, you know, there's one other thing that we, we tend to forget. We tend to remember World War I as the Western Front, but there was an Eastern Front as well, and that was in Italy. <laughs> so they may have very well been. They went to Germany because they got left there mm -hmm. because some of them came on the boats with their parents as babies mm -hmm. and they had to prove they were Canadians to come home. My uncles were there for two years. Yeah, I'm thinking they were part of the British Corps. Again, our, our focus no, was just on the Canadians weren't. at the North End. Yeah, they, weren't. they weren't part of the British Corps? They were Hitler's Army, which was part of the U.S. or something, I think. No, I, I don't know. Nobody <laughs> seems to know where they went. So you they come out of the U.S. to go there? No. Right for Canada. Huh. They just be integrated into British. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Somebody else had a question? Yeah. Just a, a question, a statement. Through the news leading up to uh, Remembrance Day, I thought I heard that, and I, it could be World War II, but I thought it was World War I, that at the time Canada had 11 million people in Canada. And one million were yeah, in ten percent. World War One, ten percent signed up. Yeah, so that, that yeah. would be happening. And the interesting thing too, and that that was starting was applicable to ten percent starting, but that's kind of a misleading figure because it really wasn't ten percent of the population. It's ten percent of the population between the ages of what seventeen mm -hmm. and thirty. Mm -hmm. So you you wouldn't find 